Welcome, my fellow Gears, Evanusa57 here. I'm back on my Xbox One playing some Gears 5. And today's video, I will be showing you everything you need to know for Gears. So yes, the video is titled A Beginner's Guide, but I have designed this video to be helpful to you, whether you are a beginner or a Gears veteran. So you could say class is in session. Anyways, in this video, I will cover everything you need to know for Escape, Horde, the campaign, and I will share some tips that I have found for Versus as well. Now, with that being said, I have already finished Re-Up 20 and just about every achievement in this game, minus two ridiculous time-consuming ones, but I do even have the seriously... 5.0 achievement so we will cover mastering the maps as well i will show you what i find to be the best spots to set up the metas for mastering horde and escape the best class builds pretty much everything you need to know in one spot in one video without further ado here we go I'm going to start off with Horde because this is the most requested game mode that I have played. It's also one of my favorite game modes. And I have had a few people ask, what is the technique that people are using? Because there's a lot of team reliance and nuances to Gears that aren't explained. And frankly, the community can be kind of toxic in two respects. One, people not knowing what they are doing and wanting to do their own thing. Two, nobody really willing to teach. So here we go. When you look at Horde, especially if you are new to the Gears series, this is a 50 wave survival game mode. And it's in sets of 10, but I'll cover the individual waves a little bit later on. The first thing you're going to see if you're queuing up for it as a new player is going to be your difficulty. Now, this is different from other Gears Horde games where not only does difficulty mean the enemies are going to be stronger, but in the new Gears, there is something called modifiers. For every difficulty you go up, there is a new modifier active. Now, each modifier is important to pay attention and learn what they do because that's going to make the game harder in a unique way. For instance, the very first modifier is called Survivor, and it makes it so that if all players go down, that's it. That's the end of the game. You can't restart. I personally hate this. It's known to most players also as the Iron Man modifier, especially if you played Gears 4. Uh, then you have more health, which increases the enemy's health, more lethal, that makes the enemies more lethal, a regen penalty, which causes the player's health to regenerate slower, execution rules, meaning enemies can only be closely killed, or they can be killed with certain things like explosives and heavy weapons. Uh, regeneration, where enemies will regenerate their health over time. And lastly, power drain, which is the farther you get into the game, the more expensive fortifications cost. Don't worry, if you're new and you don't know what fortifications are, I will explain those in a moment. You're also free to ask any questions you would like in the comment section or join my Discord. So, these are the modifiers going from beginner all the way up to master difficulty. Now, most players that I talk to, they want to know how you do masters because masters is where you get the best chance at skill cards. You get the most XP for your character, for your class, all of those things. But masters is not to be taken lightly. There are some maps you can carry on and there are some maps that you cannot carry on. There is also a clear cut meta or God squad, which is going to be your team comp. As you notice, the more modifiers we have on, on the bottom left-hand corner, shows a progression for the skill cards, and this is your drop chance for the skill cards. Keeping in mind that you cannot earn a skill card that you do not have unlocked. So if you're playing on a level 1 character and you play on the master difficulty, which I do not recommend doing, even if you rolled and the roll landed, so to speak, on a gold card you wouldn't get the gold card because your character doesn't have it unlocked yet so keep that in mind that's the biggest thing know your character know your role and know what difficulty you can actually play on not that your skills 
may not be up to par. Your skills can be up to par. You could be a veteran Gears player and play every single Gears game and go in with a team of under-leveled characters, and you're going to have one heck of a battle on your hands. It's just plain and simple, not worth the time invested. You get one skill card for every five consecutive waves of Horde that you complete successfully. So if you start the game on wave one, if you beat wave five, which is a mini boss wave, then uh, say fail on wave six or leave on wave six, you would get one skill card. You get 10 cards if you beat all 50 waves. Moving on from there, there are various maps that you can play. So you can go to custom game as well. You can host games. You can see the list of hosted games. And a lot of them will have weird titles and stuff like that. Uh, but like I said, most people are looking for how to do masters. So we'll cover that in a second. You can also set up a custom horde mode. Now from the custom horde lobby, this is you hosting a game. You can select any of the maps. All Fathers Arena, Asylum, Bunker, Dam, District, Exhibit, Forge, Foundation, Harbor, Icebound, Lift, Reclaimed, Training Grounds, and Vascar. These are the current maps available at the time of recording, which is during Operation 2 or Op 2. Eventually, they will add more maps, though. In terms of maps required for the Seriously 5.0 achievement, you only need the launch maps, not the new maps or the Gears 4 maps. So you only need Asylum, Bunker, District, Exhibit, Icebound, Lift, Training Grounds, and Vascar. And actually, sorry, you don't need Lift. Lift is a Gears 4 map. That's one of the new maps. So I misspoke on that one. Please don't hate me. <laughs> Anyways, you can select your map from here. And each map is going to follow a similar principle, but not exactly the same. So I'll actually load into a map and show you after I cover every one of the character builds. Now, while you're leveling up, it's best if you play in private games and you're going to want to play most of the time without the more health modifier on because that'll make it a lot easier for you. So when players do custom games, like when I do a speed run on Inconceivable, this is my setup of modifiers for Inconceivable. All modifiers on except double health. That makes it a heck of a lot easier to do. Obviously, if you're going to play on Master, you have to have every single modifier active. But you want to play on a lower difficulty to start off leveling up your characters. And if you don't have a consistent team or a group of people that you know to go on a higher difficulty, just be very careful going into Incon or Masters. So, moving on. You're going to look at team comp. We can have five players. It is, of course, recommended you have all five players, but it is doable with four players. It's even doable on certain maps with certain characters to do it with only three players as well. But it's going to be a lot more difficult and a lot more time consuming. So the current meta, or the current god squad, so to speak, is the character that I'm playing right now, Baird. Then you want to have Del. JD, Jack, and that's your Kerwar four characters. The fifth, some teams will run differently. Uh, they might run a Keegan for boom shots. They might dupe in a second JD. Otherwise, the fifth is normally Kate, and that's your God Squad setup. Uh, that allows you to cover everything, and I'm going to go ahead and explain each class before we get into setup points on each map. So, for Baird, I'll show you the cards that I use, and I do have a separate build video posted for him. But as you can see, as you level up, you can look at the unlocks that you get. Now, Baird really doesn't become super effective until you get to at least level 11 but it's also nice to get him up to level 15, and 16 just really isn't worth it. You'll earn XP for the class that you play. So this is the setup of cards that I use all the time. I use the Global Century upgrade, which increases all machine gun century damage. I use Global Overclock, that upgrades all weapon lockers to the point that they recharge ammo faster. 
I use experimental weapons, so DB weapons do more damage to targets that don't have full health. I use bloody support, where your precision weapons cause bleeding when your ultimate is active. And I use precision repairs, where getting a precision kill will heal all defenses on the map, with the exception of Lizzie's silverback and the energy taps. Those are the five cards that you're going to want to run for Baird. Um, now, initially, when the character's level one, you'll only be able to run one card, and you'll unlock more cards as you level up. So, for instance, Sarah Connor, this class is atrocious in Horde games and generally not wanted, but uh, maybe they'll come out with a mode or they'll give it a buff. We'll see. So, when the character's level one, you can use one card. At level three, a second card slot unlocks. At level five, the third, seven, the fourth, and nine, the fifth. But we don't really care about Sarah Connor because currently she's useless. I covered Baird. That's one of your God Squad five. Now, Dell, on the other hand, has two different setups that you can run. Where Baird's cards remain the same constantly, unless they come out with a different event that might force you to play differently, Dell's Dells can run two different setups depending upon the team. This is the normal setup, or one of the two normal variants. Ingenuity for repair efficiency, reinforced fabrication, giving your fortifications more health, efficient fabrication, allowing you to buy those fortifications at a lower cost, healing repair, which allows you to stay alive longer and repair during combat because you actually get stim while you're repairing. Not reloading, but repairing. And then armor plating to reduce the damage taken by fortifications as long as they are above 75% health, which is relatively easy to do. Dell has a bunch of other cards, and armor plating can be swapped out, but there are two cards that you will swap out if you're running with a Baird. If you're running with a Baird that knows what they're doing, so the God Squad, then you will swap out Healing Repair and Ingenuity. You don't need those two cards. You will instead run Overclocked Locker, and the last or fifth card is really up to you, but if you're going to run Sentries, I would recommend running Efficient Sentry, or you could just keep on Healing Repair if you really wanted to. Uh, you can also swap out depending on the team that you run with, armor plating for the overclocked locker if you're the only engineer there, so it is a little bit team reliant. Dell's job is to buy all the fortifications, or most of the fortifications, and upgrade all the ones that need to be upgraded, because only an engineer can actually upgrade fortifications, with the exception of Baird keeping the barriers. I'll cover that when I actually get into the game. Next up is one of my personal favorite characters, with it, which is JD. Now, his role is offense, and he's basically the primary damage dealer, or one of two primary damage dealing characters in the game. His damage comes from explosives, and specifically your favorite weapon, the Lancer GL, or a boom shot. Worst case scenario, you could use a drop shot or a salvo if you didn't have a boom shot, but you're really going to want to have the GL. And a whole weapons locker, or at least three GLs, depending upon the level of your Dell or Baird that you're playing with. As for cards, you really don't change up the settings on cards very often. There's a couple variants you can run for JD, but this is the one that most players run, and I definitely prefer. Confirmed kill, where kills with artillery recharge artillery by 15 seconds. Now, this card was nerfed drastically, uh, or changed, I should say, from original. So it doesn't recharge as fast as it used to, but it does still help recharge your ultimate pretty quickly. And your ultimate is good for hitting like flying targets, killing massive groups of enemies, uh, just extra damage on bosses, things like that. Razor Hail, which is an absolute must, where your explosive hits cause bleeding for a percentage of the damage dealt. Custom Boom Shot, increased damage with the Boom Shot and active effects. Custom Lancer GL, increased damage and active effects. 
and launcher capacity, increased ammo capacity. Now that applies to all your launcher weapons. So salvo, boom shot, drop shot, torque bow, I do believe, but I haven't actually tried it because that weapon doesn't do enough explosive damage, and definitely the Lancer GL. Also, for some reason, this includes your grenades. Really weird on that, but uh, it doesn't state it on the card. As you can see here, it only states the boom shot, torque bow, drop shot. It does not actually state the salvo or grenades or the GL, but it does. There's a lot of things that um, aren't stated on cards, but they do. Kind of uh, hidden or just something they forgot to write in. The other times, uh, some people, they'll play and they'll swap out confirmed kill for spotter support, which is good for taking out flying enemies. But in my opinion, it's not worth it. It's not something that I like to use. So that's the setup there for JD. Next up, and arguably the most important of the God Squad, is good old Jack, our little flying toaster. So this guy is extremely important because he is the money maker on the team. Not only can he remain invisible, heal people, other players, fortifications, uh, revive people just by healing them. He can also stay behind cover and heal someone through the cover. So very important character. You're going to want portable resupply. And this card has a hidden feature. It doesn't state it. But when you're carrying a weapon, your character remains invisible. Repair speed. It's not a must, but it's nice to have. This card can be substituted with explosive hijack. But it depends upon the team that you're playing with. Optimizer is an absolute must. This is where Jack makes the money. You get 200% more power when smelting. That's when you turn a weapon into the forge. Healing reach, allowing you to heal from an increased distance. And healing upgrade, allowing you to heal faster. There really aren't other cards for Jack that are super useful uh, on higher difficulties. On low difficulties, you can make like a DPS Jack where you do explosive hijack, backstab, uh, mind control, expert, zapper upgrade, things of that nature. And you just run around hijacking and killing enemies. But it's not, it's never a good idea to do that on higher difficulties because that's not your role. Your role is a support unit, not an offense unit. Last up, number five of the God Squad, Kate. Kate's role is listed as a scout. However, she's used as a primary or secondary damage dealer her ultimate ability camouflage it's really only used in cases of emergency where like jack is down or multiple people are down uh, multiple people are dead and you need to get the cog tags things of that nature her passive ability where you get power increased by 25 percent for kills nearby is all right because she is a shotgun class but it's not really that helpful, especially on higher difficulty because of the way the power is done. Now, as far as cards, there's three different builds. There's what they call a Reaper build, which is a execution stim build. It works on low difficulty, but it sucks on high difficulty, so I wouldn't really recommend it. And then there's a variation that's like a hybrid build between execution and shotgun and then there's full shotgun i recommend using full shotgun which is using the cards that i have set up here laceration that makes your shotguns cause bleeding damage cloak batteries which increases the duration of your cloak so should you need to use it in an emergency you have a longer period of time to get done what you need to get done custom nasher to increase the damage dealt by your nasher I personally like overkill ammo capacity. It gives you more ammo in the overkill, and you'll be using the overkill the majority of the time. And then blood resonance, where if an enemy is bleeding, they take increased damage from shotgun. Now, that means that you'll then do even more damage with laceration. So 
it's a really good combo to run Laceration and Blood Resonance. I would keep all of these cards. If you did want to swap one card out, I would swap out the Overkill Ammo Capacity for whatever other card it is that you want. However, in the case of playing on a higher difficulty, the only card that might make it worth it to swap would be maybe long reach and that really just depends upon the map that's only so you can get the power faster so that's the god squad setup uh there are other characters like i mentioned that you can use you can substitute in a keegan um i'll just go through all the characters but i've showed you the god squad setup Marcus, now he's been one of my favorite characters in the previous Gears games, but he's just not good enough in Gears 5. He honestly needs a buff. Uh, for being the character that the game, that the franchise has been built around, really one of the main characters that made the game series, he just isn't, there's no spice for him. He's that fifth, really not that great but he does have some interesting cards that you can use so until you get him to level 16 the setup i recommend is custom lancer rifle feedback dug in extended rifle mag and last ditch this character is classed as a tank and basically he can tank damage by being in cover he can take more damage as his health decreases he can take more damage and he has a fun card down here called Band of Brothers that you unlock at level 16, which is while you're using Living Legend, you receive 25 stim per second. This is what really makes Marcus a tank. Combined with Rifle Feedback, where Rifle Hits increase Living Legend time by 48%, that's 48% at level 2 of the damage dealt by Rifle Hits, which is why we also run the Custom Lancer card, it's pretty nice. You can tank boom shots, like repeatedly tank boom shots with that stim, even on Master difficulty. However, he will not do as much damage as a good JD or a good Kate. So, uh, really situational. I don't ever use him, especially on speedruns. Then you have Foz. Foz, his role is offense, but they really kind of just drop the ball with Foz. He's not the sniper from Gears 4. He is a, technically a sniper class, and most of his cards revolve around sniping, but he's not as good. So I recommend Exploit Weakness. They did buff this card by changing it to all the time increased critical damage as opposed to only critical damage using his ultimate, which his ultimate does allow you to see and shoot enemies through walls. So not bad, but you have to wait for his ultimate and well, you're just not going to get the kills away from a JD. You'll get a few, but it's not worth it on Incon or Masters. Modified long shot, so the long shot does more damage. Ambush, which they finally unnerfed, thankfully, where you now do increased critical damage to unwounded targets, only helpful if you have the increased health modifier on. If you don't have the increased health modifier on, it automatically counts the target as being wounded, so ambush does not help there. Long shot handling, which is like a absolute must, it is a chance to automatically reload if you get a critical kill, which is freaking phenomenal. And then the last card is really up to you. Until you unlock other cards, I kind of like Explosive Critical Hit or Critical Parade. Now, Critical Parade does not function as the card is stated, and that's why I don't like it that much. Um, originally, this card said Critical Hits Extend Duration, similar to Rifle Feedback, but it's actually, and they finally did change it, only critical kills extend the duration this is really good for later waves if you can get Foz a try shot but without a try shot it's not really that great so it's kind of personal preference you can use whatever you would like there 
but since he revolves so much around his ultimate, I would recommend that you have either patience on, or if you were running with a Lizzie, then you're going to want the Icy Precision. But uh, Icy Precision at that point would void Ambush, so it's a toss-up. I will say that this guy can do insane damage. Even without my cards maxed, I have on lower difficulty, I'm talking like intermediate to advanced, I have been able to one-shot kill a Swarmak. But that is stacking all of your damage into that one shot. You can't do it on Masters. So he just kind of feels lackluster. Next up, you have the Scorpio Squad characters. These characters were not originally available in Horde. That's Keegan, Mac, and Lonnie. They're the Hive Busters, or the Escape characters. And they're alright in Horde, but they're not the best. Because most of their cards revolve around Venom, and there's no Venom at this time, and no way to get Venom at this time in Horde. So for Keegan, there's a couple setups that you can run, but mainly he's like a, a mini JD that's a little bit chewier. Um, he doesn't have the ammo capacity that a JD has, but if you give him a rack of boom shots, since he starts with a boom shot, well, that helps out quite a bit. Uh, recharge Bounty, which when you mark a target and you kill that target or anyone kills that target, it reduces their ultimate cooldown by a percentage, which is pretty nice. Then I like Modified Hammer Burst because that helps out in the early rounds, but you could swap that card out. Resupply Duration and Resupply Healing Module, which reduces incoming damage while you're standing in the resupply. If you do swap out Modified Hammer Burst, I would recommend swapping it out with Resupply Amplifier. That will increase the radius of resupply drastically, allowing you to also kind of mitigate some of the damage for your team. As I said, not a terrible fifth, but not really that great either. Then you have Lonnie, who is a scout. Um, her Electro Blade is nice. She has the same passive ability as Kate but she's really not useful in Horde. Uh, even with all of her deflection cards on to like run out there and grab power, she's all focused on melee or flanking if you run the on the flank card. So I've yet to actually find an efficient spot for her, even though she's my favorite character in Escape, I've yet to really find a good way to use her effectively in a Masters Horde run. You also have Mac. Now, Mac's a little interesting because he's a role of a tank, but he's not going to be as tanky as Marcus is, and he's not as tanky as Lizzie is. So he's more a DPS, and he's really good in Escape, but again, not so good in Horde. So you can use Bloody Shot and Boltock Bandolier to get as much ammo as possible and use the ammo boxes for your pistol rounds which will help in the beginning along with crazy tough and then i would recommend running the two barrier cards so you could set up and stand in front of say your jd or your kate or something and block all incoming damage while they dps down the boss but that's very situational next we have new characters or characters unlocked with DLC, which there is one character that I don't have, and I'll cover her last. So you have the Cog Gear. Now, the Cog Gear is a good fifth. Uh, this guy, his role is support, but arguably he's also a tank. So his ultimate is Team Revive. As long as your teammates are not Cog Tags, if they're downed, then if you have your ultimate, you can use your ultimate and you'll revive all downed players, which is really nice. Also, he has a passive ability where enemies that die with your mark on it reduce the cooldown of your ultimate. That's very important in getting your cooldown back. For cards, until you have your character at level 16, I recommend Perfect Conditioning, Razor's Edge, Suppressive Recharge, Team Repair, and Healing Bounty. Eventually, once you have the character at level 16, I would recommend swapping out Healing Bounty with Get Up, where your team revive gives you and teammates stim. That's very important. And it's a similar setup 
except for obviously you don't need team repair when you run this character in escape. Instead of team repair in escape, you would more than likely want to run the helpful headshots card or possibly like uh, depending on the map a custom lancer or modified snub card moving on from the cog gear we have the halo characters now these characters are available if you have the game pass ultimate or if you got the ultimate edition of the game so you have emil who's one of the best characters in escape but not that useful in horde and you have cat now, Emil's ultimate is a drop shield. It's very situational, but you could activate the drop shield and it prevents all projectiles from passing through. Now, this means enemies can't shoot you and it means you can't shoot them. So very situational, but say you had a couple teammates down, uh, you could pop that shield, run back, pick up your teammates. It gives you a little bit of breathing room. For him, he doesn't really have that many cards and he's basically a melee character. So... You're either going to want to run the score boost cards if you're doing a score boost run, or you're going to want to use his regular cards. Close range recharge, big knife, bloody blade, halo, and drop shield duration. You could replace one of those cards, like the close range recharge or the drop shield duration, with the custom Nasher and make him a little bit like a Kate. But he's basically going to sit in the back with a try shot. He's not really that useful on high difficulty. The next Halo character you have is Cat. Uh, now she's classed as an engineer as well. She has a hologram as her ultimate, which is all right for certain situations, but not really that great. And her engineering cards are eh, all right, not really that great as well. Uh, so she has cards similar to Flow or Ingenuity, which basically is the same card. Uh, she doesn't have the Efficient Fabrication, though. So it's kind of like... Basically, she's a secondary engineer, but since the God Squad is Dell and Baird, there's really no place for Cat in Horde or Escape, sadly. I really haven't liked that character as i mentioned sarah connor earlier nothing really great to write home about with sarah connor um she's kind of like the grenade soldier from gears 4 where you can have grenade capacity grenades that do more damage more heavy weapon ammo but other than that she just doesn't fit in she really needs a rework or a buff Baird I already showed you, which is fantastic, plus has a little hidden mechanic as well. And then there's Lizzie. Now, Lizzie is one of the new characters in Op 2, or Operation 2, and her role is a tank, but she's kind of a DPS tank. Her ultimate summons the Silverback, and her passive ability is enemies that die with her mark reduce the cooldown of the ultimate, just like Jax. Now... When you start off at level 1, if you do not have a weapon card equipped, your silverback will not have any weapons, so keep that in mind. I recommend, until you hit level 16, that you run Healing Try Shot, Aggressive Armor, Bleeding Mulcher, Healing Explosives, and the last card is really entirely up to you. Um, but once you hit level 16, you're going to remove the Rear Armor card, and you're going to remove Bleeding Mulcher. Bleeding Mulcher you'll want to replace with the Silverback Salvo card, where Salvo hits increase the duration of Silverback. And then you'll want to replace the fifth card with Cold Finish, where when you deal damage to an enemy with low health, it freezes them. That's super helpful. Now that card you actually unlock earlier... Uh, you unlock the cold finish card at level 14, and then the silverback card, the gold card, at level 16. Sisters to the End is useful in Escape, but it's not as useful in Horde. So you might wish to replace the Rear Armor card and uh, Bleeding Mulcher as well for the Escape runs. Now that covers all of the characters builds so now i'm going to show you general setup uh, and explain a little bit about the maps on master 
So, for the, mastering the maps, now that you understand the characters and the meta builds for each character, also the meta squad, each map is going to be a little bit different, but they're going to share a lot of similarities. There's a couple maps that are going to be harder than other maps. The hardest maps, in my opinion, to master in terms of both frustration and time that it takes to do it, are going to be Icebound, Lift, Training Grounds, and Vaskar. Those are the hardest maps. The rest of them are relatively easy, and most of them you're going to funnel the enemies down into two or three lanes. Uh, Forge is also very time-consuming, but it is one of the easier maps. Icebound and Vaskar were the two that were the absolute worst for me. So I'm going to go ahead and load up a map and show you the basics of it as far as setup and building and all of that fun stuff. Now before I load into the map, I do want to explain that you're looking at a different setup than what you would normally have because I'm by myself and this is just for the video purposes. This is not specifically for an actual run, but I'll explain where you need to be. So we are going to do this for that whole explanation purposes. I'm gonna do it without it being on master difficulty because I will not have enough time to explain. And you can do the starting wave obviously it would be on wave one which when you start a game on wave one all the players involved they start with 1000 power or energy whatever you want to call it when the game actually starts but if you start on a higher wave for building purposes then you'll see that you'll start with more energy however just disregard that but that's why it will be more energy than normal when i load into this map so i'm going to show you exhibit this is arguably the easiest map in the game because there's two specific bosses that you can't get you cannot get a kestrel and you cannot get a swarmac on this map those are the two most annoying bosses on just about any horde map so the way Horde works, as I mentioned earlier, it's 50 waves, and there are five sets of 10. So basically round 1 through 10, and then round 11 through 20, and it just keeps going in that nature. The fifth wave is considered a mini boss. The 10th wave is a boss wave, and those are your most deadly after each set of 10 waves, there will be what's called a poison applied. Now, that poison is a modifier that further modifies the game outside of just the normal difficulty modifiers. So there's double health, double accuracy, double damage. Then on the last set of waves, so the 41 through 50, all of those poisons go to two and a half times. Now, I don't have any basic modifiers on. If you pull up the screen, you can see your difficulty. You can see the names of all the skills that you have equipped, and you can also check your active tour objectives. So very important when you start a horde game, you want to look at the map if it's your first time playing. Generally speaking, one of the spawn points is going to be where you should set up. So like Ocean Spawn, Brumok Spawn, uh, in the case of Exhibit, there's actually a speed run that I can show you where you set up in the dead center of the map and force the enemies to spawn in Ocean Spawn and Brumok Spawn. But normally speaking, on a map, you're going to set up in either the spawn or the opposite side of spawn. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that rule depending upon the game. But you generally want to set up in the spawn because you want the enemies to come to you. You want to funnel them into a kill box. So on exhibit, we can set up with putting a couple barriers here and a couple barriers here. 
Then as you get more power and energy and you can push out, you'll move the barriers out to barriers on these stairs. And you can even push out as far as putting barriers in this entire section right here. And then you stick your Kate on this wall right here so she can cover this entire section with her shotgun with a weapons locker right behind her. And then normally JD will chill around here with his weapons locker so he can rain GLs down on that area and that area, which will be the two main spawn points. You can do the same thing on the other side of the map. Um, it's just a little bit different, but it's basically exactly the same. So when a wave starts and you start the game, once you realize where you want to go, you're going to go ahead and pick up the fabricator, move it to where you want it to be. Now, I do recommend that it is in close proximity and behind your wire, unless you're doing one of the speed runs that requires the fabricator to be placed in a specific location. So for setting up in the spawn here, I generally like to put the fabricator there. Once you set the fabricator down, you'll have 30 seconds to build before the wave starts. So generally at the beginning, you want to go ahead and put all of your money into the fabricator so that the engineers can build what they need to go ahead and get the wave done. And usually you'll build usually two barriers and then your forge, but that does change a little bit depending upon the team comp that you're playing on uh, and playing with. So you'll want to build a forge right away if your team can hold out and you have a decent jack. And usually you can get the forge by wave two. Uh, then you upgrade the forge depending on the difficulty that you're playing on uh, and the skill of the players you're playing with. Plus, in addition to that, the skill of the jack that you're playing with. You will go ahead and upgrade the forge all the way to four then buy the barriers and weapons lockers or you might only upgrade the forge to level three and at that point then upgrade um, either the weapons locker or at least buy a weapons locker for your jd the other thing to keep in mind is when you kill an enemy the power will drop on the ground as a double stack and it's roughly about 15 20 seconds after the enemy is killed and the power drops on the ground, if it's not picked up, it will cut itself in half. So the power value will become half of what it is normally. That's very important to keep in mind because you need as much power as possible when going through and playing this mode. Other than that, proceed through the rounds. Uh, kill off everything, pick up power as fast as possible. It's also recommended that you work with your teammates. So for instance, Dell starts with an overkill. If I had a Kate here, I'd go ahead and trade my weapon. I'd trade my overkill for Kate's Retro Lancer so that Kate would have both of her shotguns to work with and cause even more damage. Another thing to note is when you pick up the power, it does not matter who picks up the power because it is given to all players on the team, except for bots. Bots can't pick up power. They can steal it, but they can't pick up power. They can't use any abilities. They can't buy fortifications or anything like that. So usually you get a forge by wave two. You have it to rank four, which is max by wave six. Even that's a little bit late. Uh, so you may need to buy a weapons locker in between those periods an engineer is the only class that can actually upgrade so as you see i upgraded the barrier now there are two tips with that when you upgrade something make sure that it's repaired first because it will actually be less expensive to upgrade when it's fully repaired than if you were upgrading it and it had a little bit of damage. This is especially important when it comes to the really annoying forge. So just keep that in mind. Repair before upgrading. Sentry guns are the only exception if you have like a level 1 sentry gun or level 2 sentry gun and it's out of ammo but it has full health. You can upgrade it and you only have to pay a cost of 1 power for the ammunition. 
once you're comfortable that you can, another important tip is skip. You always want to skip whenever possible, <clears throat> unless your engineer needs the time to repair fortifications. Another thing is you never want to take barriers to level three. There's only a few exceptions to that rule. The reason being this actually will stop an enemy, but not only does it cost more to repair, it takes damage a lot faster than a level two barrier. So do keep that in mind. Like it will stop the enemy, but not only will it take damage from like its use damage as it depletes, it will also on top of that take damage from the enemy directly attacking it. So you really have to be careful about using those higher level barriers. For the most part, you wanna use level two barriers and you kinda wanna put them like that. If you put the barrier the long way, while the barrier will not cover the entire entrance and you'll have to use two or four barriers depending on how big the entrance is, it will keep the enemies in the barrier longer, thereby slowing them down and doing more damage to them. If you have a weak fortification that you don't want it to take damage, or you have a fortification that you just don't want to take damage, period, you can move it to where it's red and then set the fortification down, and a red fortification will not take damage from enemies, but it also will not do anything at all. All fortifications can eventually be upgraded to a max level of level 4, but most of the fortifications are not worth it at level 4, with the exceptions being the forge, the weapon locker, and maybe a decoy or um, your primary sentry. If you're going to use machine gun sentries, a later setup for like this map would be to put a couple sentries at the front gate or up closer to the stairs backing up Kate over here once the silly leaderboard screen goes away or you could put a couple shocks out shocks are less expensive than MG sentries but you can put a MG sentry here facing out and an MG sentry here facing out because MG sentries are one of the few things that can actually kill a downed enemy that has execution rules on so just keep that in mind uh, as you go everybody is going to continue to donate their power to the fabricator it's even recommended engineers donate their power to the fabricator just in case you get disconnected from the game because there really is no point in keeping the power on you unless you're going to use it for perks which you should only be using it for perks at a much much later round. So I'm going to return to the lobby so I can show you what those perks are real quick because engineers do not have perks. Um, engineers only have the ability to build and upgrade all fortifications whereas other classes have the ability to buy perks but they cannot upgrade fortifications and they're limited on the fortifications that they can actually build. Remember that the later it gets in the wave the more expensive the fortifications will become if you have the power drain modifier on and for every five fortifications that you buy they go up in cost as well so i'm going to go ahead and do the exact same thing but i'm going to change up the map so i'll show you another map that functions similarly uh, basically all of these maps spawn setup spawn setup spawn setup uh forge is an exception to the rule where you set up actually in the tower because the spawn is too wide and there's no cover but one of the hardest ones i'll go ahead and show is vascar and uh, i'm going to do that with my jd so this is where you'll have other players buy fortifications for you when another player buys the fortification for you you'll have the ability to upgrade said fortification as an engineer that is 
then it becomes your fortification. But this way you can buy the fortification at a less expensive price. So eventually, say Dell's bought, you know, weapon lockers and centuries and the forge and all this, his cost for barriers is going to be higher. So they'll ask like another character that can buy barriers to buy barriers for them so they can get them cheaper and then upgrade the barriers or upgrade the weapons locker or whatever it might be at that particular time to the level that it needs to be. Now, Vascar, same thing. You want to set up in the spawn, but you actually want to set up up here. Now, this becomes a three-lane map at this point with no room to back up because your back is literally against the wall. So a very important thing, if you're playing JD or if you don't have a JD and you're playing a Keegan, you are going to want to get the ammo boxes. Make sure you have full explosive ammo before you start. Now, since you can't increase the explosive ammo on Keegan, it's not as needed for that. But JD should first run out and grab both ammo boxes. That is if you have your launcher capacity card on. Then you're going to want to bring the fabricator. And you're going to want to actually bring the fabricator to a bit of an odd spot. Because on this map, you can actually block off one of the entrances you can block it mostly with the fabricator, which is pretty cool, actually. And uh, I might not have my positioning 100% correct, so just keep that in mind. But it's kind of an angled position. You can also do it straight. When bots are in your way, it makes it almost impossible to place this. But you'll have to mess with the placement a little bit and you can get it placed in a manner that enemies can't actually come up these stairs and then you can just back it up with a sentry gun. As you can see, JD can build barriers and sentries, but that's it. So eventually, JD will be the one to end up buying some barriers for the Dell or Baird to upgrade. And uh, of course, you can see how slow he moves with those barriers so i just put that there to show that off but normally the round would start the game would start and you dump all your money in dell starts buying the fortifications that he needs to buy baird starts buying the fortifications that he needs to buy depending upon the team and you generally let baird own all the fortifications jd stays back and he acts as a good damage dealer so on this map you have the main entrance that enemies are coming from you have the right side and you have that left side area uh, as JD I like to kind of stay in the middle because I can cover at least two directions initially you're going to be using your Lancer and Nasher uh, saving your Lancer GL rounds for larger groups of enemies if you go down you do go down fairly easy bots can revive you uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind bots can revive but most of the time they just get in the way the gl is a weapon that you have to learn to master it is a weapon that is harder to uh master and by the way i'm on master difficulty so just to show you the difference in modifiers wave 11 beginner super freaking easy wave 11 master and they have a lot more health, they deal a lot more damage, they're almost instant killing me. They are instantly killing the bots. Plus, obviously, I have the regen penalty and everything like that. But this is basically what that initial setup, setup phase is always a problem. Also, another tip when you have the forge, if you are going to kill yourself to get another weapon or more ammo, you always want to drop the weapon that you don't want by holding the direction on the D-pad that the weapon is equipped in. This way, Jack can go ahead and forge that weapon, thereby giving the team more power. Keeping in mind with that, though, when you die, you'll go to cog tags you can then put those cog tags in the fabricator as long as you're not playing with all bots like I was 
and respawn. When you respawn, you'll come back with your starting set of weapons. So this is how your JDs, Keegan's, um, Kate to a certain extent, if she needs another Nasher or uh, an engineer, will get extra weapons for the team. All right, so with that being said, I showed you all that fun stuff. The last thing I'm going to show you is actually smelting, just to keep, you know, the video going here. And that's Jack's job. You can do it where you set up the uh, forge and you have players run weapons, but it's really not worth it. Uh, training grounds you set up in one of the spawns. Lifts you set up in one of the spawns. Icebound you set up in one of the spawns. Pretty much every map. The spawns uh, starting or opposite are the easiest to do that with. The only exception to this rule is district where you could use the arcade. But generally speaking, you don't really use the arcade because it takes so freaking long to open. Another easy map is All Fathers Arena. But this map is also very open. So just keep that in mind if you're doing this. Um, I'm going to show you forging. So I'm going to take those modifiers off. And I'm actually going to play Jack real quick. We are going to do starting wave 11 again. Because I can buy the forge. And there's little tricks of the trade with that. You can have your teammates run weapons for you. So... If you are like a JD and you're not using your Nasher, because you really shouldn't be using your Nasher after like the first five waves. Once you have a weapons locker, you shouldn't be using your Nasher. You can drop your Nasher on the ground, let Jack burn it, and then you can run or help run weapons so that it's not just Jack getting weapons. The more energy that you have, the more you can upgrade, the more you can build, and the easier the game will be, especially in the event that you get a boss that destroys some of your fortifications. Because when you get a boss, it's up to JD to melt that boss, or whoever your DPS characters are to just melt that boss. Uh, so same thing goes on this map, set up in the spawns, but because this map really doesn't have any cover for you to hide in, um, it's not my favorite. It's very prone to enemies taking cover and trying to snipe you from a considerable distance. Now, Jack cannot actually use weapons. He does have a little electrical zapper, but on higher difficulty, if you're zapping things, well, there's something wrong with your team. Uh, placing the fabricator as Jack can be a bit of a pain in the ass, but once again, same thing. Um, you'll place the fabricator, you'll put all your money into the fabricator, and then as soon as you have enough money, Dell will build the forge. Uh, or whatever engineer you have will build the forge. If you have no engineer, you're probably already in a sticky situation, but technically, Jack can build the forge himself, and you can also build weapon lockers. Now, I don't have access to any of those wonderful weapons. I can't buy weapons, but I can go ahead and shock targets. As you can see, it really doesn't do that much damage, but it does stun them and it does automatically mark them. Excuse me there. Now, because I have that portable resupply card on, you can see that I'm carrying a weapon. And even though I'm carrying a weapon, I am still invisible. This is a very important thing for Jack. You can also use the left trigger, which is your heal, and you can tether a player, thereby constantly healing them. And they might go down, but you'll be able to instantly revive them. That's how you revive people. So we're going to go ahead and build the forge right here just to show you. Normally, Jack isn't the one to buy it. You want Dell to buy it so that it's cheaper. But then Jack goes and picks up weapons, takes them to the forge, and smelts them. It doesn't seem like that much. It's only 60 to start with on most of these basic weapons. But it adds up, especially once the forge gets to level 4. 
when the forge is level four and you have maxed optimizer you can get 360 power per player per basic weapon that you smelt so like each one of these enforcers would turn into 360 power per person and then each player would go ahead and deposit that power into the fabricator for at least the first 15 waves then they can start working on perks but that does depend a little bit on your team so i mentioned perks earlier at the build phase you will have the ability to press y without activating your ultimate and you can buy perks by pressing the direction that they are on in the d-pad most characters have health and damage and things like that but none of these perks are an absolute must have uh, they are not going to help you more than defenses will so keep that in mind also remember that weapons that are on the ground can despawn after a limited amount of time and a weapon that is dropped by a player will despawn when the new round starts so just keep that in mind if you're running guns for jack to burn that unfortunately jack has to be quick or you have to hold on to that gun uh, and that's the way that you go slowly build and upgrade generally speaking like this we don't have fortifications out i would red that forge so right now the forge can't take damage then when there's only a few enemies left you'll go ahead and unred the forge which means you'll make the forge usable and then you'll go ahead and run weapons for jack or jack will always be looking for weapons himself now what you should do as jack is when you come back with a weapon Go ahead and smelt it, take a look around on the ground, buy the forge to see if there are any weapons there. If they are weapons on the ground there at the forge, go ahead and forge them and then fly out for the next gun. If there aren't any weapons there, just fly out for the next gun right away. Communication with your team is insanely important with this because they should be telling you if they are running weapons for you and they should also be communicating with you to let you know that there are weapons then there at the forge waiting for you. Uh, keeping in mind that explosive weapons are worth more, so larger weapons actually have a higher worth on them. Uh, Nashers, Marxes, those are worth more. And then, of course, salvos, drop shots, boom shots, uh, things of that nature, torque bows. Those can be worth up to, I believe it's like 760 uh, is the most that you can get from those with 200% optimizer and a level 4 forge. So Jack's going to be always moving. He's going to be healing people. He's going to be reviving people. He's going to be smelting weapons whenever possible. All of that fun stuff. Also, currently on All Fathers Arena and on Lift, the two new maps you can pick up the ammo box as Jack and you can move that. Now that's something that sadly the devs said they are removing, but that is something that you can do. It's really silly that they're removing that feature because the ammo boxes are not helpful. They're only really decent in certain situations. But that's how Jack plays and that covers the wonderful perk system. So again, perks aren't really that helpful. The last thing to keep in mind is currently Baird and Lizzie have a unstated mechanic. I'm not quite sure if it's intended, so I would not base your entire strategy around it. But they do have a weird functionality where barriers owned by that character import the special effect from that character. In other words... Baird's barriers bleed, and Lizzie's barriers actually can freeze targets if you have said cards equipped. So I'm going to show you, again, exactly what I'm talking about. I do apologize for the loading screens. But like I mentioned at the start of the video, this is everything you need to know. If I didn't cover something related to a specific scenario, message me and let me know. I will definitely help out. So currently, uh, this has been in the game since the start of Operation 2. 
the devs have made no comment whether it is intended to work this way, not intended to work this way, or if they have any plans of changing it. So I will cover it as now it seems to just be a general game feature. And this is why it used to be the engineer owned all fortifications. But when you play with a Baird, Baird needs to own the barriers and then Dell will own the rest of the fortifications because Baird's barriers with the card setup that I showed you will bleed and technically you can do a similar effect with Lizzie where Lizzie's barriers will bleed. Now normally for district you're going to set up in one of the spawns. You have three lanes to start the center lane and both side lanes, uh, but eventually you can kind of block off the center lane. This is one of the few maps that you can do that with. You can block off the center completely uh, so that the enemies won't come from that direction. And there is actually a way that you can open this arcade and you can set up in the arcade if you want to. Uh, it is slower to set up in the arcade, but there will be only one direction that they can come from. So setting up here, I'm just going to quickly show you. Uh, I don't know how well this will work because I have bots on the team. And the bots will probably kill everything. But if I take these barriers and I set the barriers up out here as Baird, as long as Baird is the owner of the barriers, he must have a precision weapon in his hands and he must have his ultimate ready. But as long as he has those two things... And, of course, is alive, because if he's not dead, it, you know, it's always a plus to not be dead. But uh, I need to get an enemy to hit one of these barriers. And as they go through the barriers, they will actually take damage. And they will bleed. So, just something to keep in mind. But like I said, with bots, it's a very difficult thing to do, because bots are a pain in the butt. So I'm just going to put that there and try and back off enough that you can see this enemy actually enter the barrier. You see that tracker just blew up. Unfortunately, oh, there we go. You see how that guy's taking damage and just died, even though I didn't touch him and the bot didn't touch him. That's Baird's barriers bleeding really weird mechanic like I said not entirely 100% sure but that will also proc precision repairs even without that mechanic which I hope they don't necessarily change it but even without that mechanic Baird is fantastic for repairing all fortifications because all he has to do is get a couple precision weapon kills around and that is precision weapon, not precision kill itself. So it doesn't have to be a headshot. It just has to be a precision weapon kill. And the M-Bar is capable of killing a downed target, even with execution rules on. So that's how that works. I do believe that covers just about everything for the game mode horde. I covered all the maps. I covered all the characters. I gave you the meta and the god squad meta. So just keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that when you play on Masters, 90% of the teams out there want you to have at least a level 15 character, and they want your cards to be at least like level 3, minimum. So you really have to know what you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of pressure that falls on the JD and the Engineer. So just keep that in mind. Now let's move on to Escape. So Escape is completely different. While I did show you some Escape characters, Escape on the other hand is a much faster paced game mode. There will always be a weekly hive and then there will be past hives. Now when you click on the hive you will see a set of modifiers also corresponding to the difficulty. However, these modifiers are not the same as Horde. Each map will have unique modifiers, so it's a very good idea to read what the modifier actually does before you put the modifier on. The weekly hive will be different than the past hives, and if you go to the leaderboard for every single hive, 
you will notice that the current weekly hive and the past hives, the current past hives that is, have a leaderboard. If you get a top 1% time, you get a weapon skin. If you get a top 10% time, you get a weapon skin. Sometimes top 50% gets a weapon skin, but most of the time it's XP. And if you complete the map, you're in the top 100%, so you get a little XP when the leaderboard pays out. But that's how I got some of my really cool skins, is from being top 1%. Uh, most of the maps, I'm in the top 50 worldwide, uh, so yeah these are done completely different than a normal masters run just as a heads up for you if you go to past hives you'll see the past hives available again the past five hives that you do as long as they're in the past hive section the current ones they have a leaderboard as well with different rewards like i said most of these maps uh, every one of the maps I have a top 1% time in. Most of the maps I am in the top 50 or at the very least top 100 in the world for. Uh, some maps top 200 just depending on if I went back to beat the time. Every map is going to function differently. As I mentioned, every map will have different modifiers. So do keep that greatly in mind. With that being said, it functions the same way. You can do public or you can do private, you can search for a custom game, and you'll see a whole bunch of different custom games. You can also then host a public or private game as well. And if you host a game, you can play on any of the maps. You can play on any of the current maps from Operation 2, Operation 1, whatever operation we're on when you're watching this video, or of course the older maps. Keeping in mind each map will have different modifiers on it though uh, so it will depend a little bit on the map that you play but most of these maps you're going to have to go through and kill enemies and things like that uh, there's a few different speed runs the clock has a good speed run for getting cards the surge has a really good speed run for getting cards but it really helps if people know what they're doing people have to know what they're doing for the speed runs to work so if you want to do like a speed run a speed run you're going to run past everything whereas on a regular run you wouldn't run past everything now in terms of characters generally speaking for every map unless you're duping in a second character because you can technically only have one of each character. But for every map, you're going to want, if there's explosive weapons, especially if there's grenades, you're going to want a Keegan, because explosive weapons are like his specialty. And generally speaking, resupply duration, grenade, pouch, venom explosive resupply, shredder, and recharge bounty are the go-to cards for your Keegan. You're also going to want a Lonnie, with the go-to cards being Thrill of the Hunt, Venom Blade, Shock Chain, Venom Resistance, and Brawler, now that they actually fixed Shock Chain and it's working correctly. And then a Mac with Boltock Bandolier, Bloody Shot, Adrenaline Junkie, Crazy Tough, and Venom Resistance. So Escape plays completely different than Horde, as I mentioned. Escape plays more in a fast-paced, your back is always up against the wall kind of feeling, and usually on higher difficulty, you want to ride the Venom. I'll show you that in a second. You can take in other characters. Uh, some people like to take in a Cog Gear because they're really tanky, some people also like to take in a meal. A meal is really, really good in escape because he can bleed targets outside of the venom, unlike Lonnie who can only bleed targets in venom. And on top of that, every so many seconds when he's not damaged, he gains stim, which is a very helpful thing. So since it doesn't look like I am going to get anyone to join and uh, I don't feel like doing that solo I'm going to show you a different map I am not going to show you every single strategy for every single map 
but I will give you the basics of it. So I'm going to play my Lonnie, and I'm going to do Venom Run just to show you real quick on this one. Now, with that being said, Venom Run is one of the most annoying maps on Master. So I'm not going to run through it on Master just yet. But if you want to get a top 1% time, most of the maps currently will require you to play on Inconceivable or Masters, and they will also require you to run the Score Boost cards. Now, the score boost cards are very important on maps that have cog tags, but they're very important in general. So remember that you're going to need the person with the highest score boost to pick up the cog tags. And ideally, especially for like the new map, it's best if all players have the score boost cards. So I'm just going to run through this real quick. And then uh, that'll basically cover it. You have this cinematic that unfortunately there's nothing that you can do about. You're stuck with it. You have to watch it every time. And then you go into the loading screen and you have another cinematic after that. Which is what makes Escape more annoying. Because you have all these, for lack of a better word, load screens. Venom Run is kind of like a speed run, but it's very dependent on the seed set. Or the set of enemies, which is why I'm not playing on Master for the point of this video. But generally speaking, most of the maps, when you play on Master difficulty, it's about going slow, creeping up on enemies so you can get the execution, making sure that you execute the targets that you can execute, but always let Keegan mark the targets so that people can get their ultimates back faster. Efficient use of ammunition because ammo is very limited in almost every single escape map and efficient use of your time because you don't have a lot of time. Now, when you play on master difficulty, you usually not always, but usually you're working with the venom or riding the venom because of those venom boost cards. Uh, for instance, Lonnie being able to take more damage and bleed targets while in the venom and she heals when she's next to bleeding targets. Or Mac being able to have Adrenaline Junkie and deal more damage when in Venom. Or Keegan where he can resupply ammunition for explosive weapons when he's in Venom. So the Venom is very important. There's also an achievement associated with getting so many kills while in the Venom. Keeping in mind that there are two types of Venom. There's basically what's known as the pre-venom, which is a lighter shade of green, and then there's the toxic venom that does damage to you. So there's also cog tags around the map, and when you pick up a cog tag, they'll give you time. Uh, that's what helps the most with your runs. Uh, so venom run, I really didn't need to pick up this, but... I did. I wanted to show you what the cog tags were. And you'll notice that immediately I'm in what's called the pre-venom, which is why I'm running Lonnie, because I can go ahead and bleed targets just by meleeing them while I'm in the venom. So it depends on the seed set that you get when you're playing this map on master difficulty. If you get the grenadier, you need to go into that room and you're going to want to grab the stims. Everybody grabs a stim and then everybody grabs the flashes or your two best people with flashes, they grab those because uh, you'll need them for the Grenadier and you'll need them for the Mulcher Scion. There is a room right there. You'll have to check it for cog tags if you didn't get that insane lucky spawn that I did where I had all the cog tags right there. But this is pretty much one of those maps where you run past most of the enemies you might need to flash these enemies right here if you get Grenadiers here. Uh, since I'm playing Lonnie, I don't really need to do that because of the bleed damage. But you'll generally ride the leading edge of the Venom, aggro the enemies, bring them back, kill them, Max stays in the Venom, flash this guy if he's a Mulcher Scion. Uh, if he's not a Mulcher Scion, there can be Juvies or Rejects there. Juvies and Rejects, you can just gun down. It's not really a problem, or you can melee them. These guys, there's Grenadiers here, 
melee them. There's a Mulcher Scion up here. If you're playing on Master difficulty, you might have to use your Flashes to get past those Grenadiers. And you'll definitely have to use your Flash to go ahead and get past that Mulcher. Eventually on every map, you'll come to the exit where you'll go ahead and pull the lever and that will cause even more enemies to spawn. Uh, it'll automatically start closing the door if the venom, the toxic venom, that dark green venom that does damage to you, if that venom is too close to the exit, it'll automatically start closing the door. Warning, Lonnie loses all of her buffs the moment that she steps across this line because the venom will never come past that point then if you get through it congratulations you just completed the map uh, like i said this is one of the faster maps it's extremely dependent upon what enemies you get and where you get them for master difficulty but on lower difficulties you can just run right through it i use this map to show you what the venom actually was uh, since i can't show you a full master's run on every single map one of my buddies uh, I lap the flash you can check out his channel because he's posted videos for I do believe every single map on masters if I were to go through every single map on pa masters right now though you'd probably have a six hour video on your hands and I know you guys didn't bring enough popcorn for that so that covers everything for horde pretty much everything for escape except for the speed runs. As I mentioned, the Surge is a really good speed run, and another one that's very popular is the Clock. These are useful for getting cards for your characters. Um, I already have all of my cards that I need for my Lonnie, so there's not really a point or much of a point in me running Lonnie, but uh, you can keep getting duplicates, and hopefully one day we will be able to upgrade our cards to level 6, and uh, be able to scrap duplicates like they did in Gears 4. Lastly, you have the campaign. Uh, you can do campaign if you want, custom load, new chapters, all of that. Uh, keeping in mind that you're looking for collectibles, there's not really a lot of special things on the campaign except for the side missions that you can do in Act 2 and Act 3. Um, since those acts are open world, I won't spoil any of the storyline for you, but I will say that this game has the most hidden things for you to collect in terms of collectibles, upgrade components, side missions, relic weapons, uh, and things of that nature of any of the Gears campaigns. Plus, it is also the most limited on ammunition, so you do have to be careful and make your shots count uh, the ammo boxes don't give as much ammo as in previous gears campaigns and they're not as prevalent or as large as they were in previous gears campaigns but that's pretty simple and straightforward you can have three people in the campaign one person must be playing the main character and then the other person can either play the secondary character or they can play jack uh, which is the robot if you're playing in the acts that have that. Uh, or I believe his name is Dave in the prologue, but I'm not 100% sure. You only really get to play that character for the first little bit, which covers that. Now, versus, you can do quick play, which is where you have your arcade, classic, free-for-all, or co-op versus AI. You can do challenges in co-op versus AI, and you do earn honor in co-op versus AI, then you have your ranked game modes, and of course you have your weekly game mode. Uh, I'm not a super big fan of the verses in this game, mainly because it's very heavily team reliant and the Nasher is very inconsistent. But if you are playing with a team, you want to make sure that the people that are best with the weapons get the correct weapons. So make sure the power weapon goes to whoever needs it, and the verses is about controlling the map, rotating and controlling the power weapon so that you have that advantage there's also a lot of things like up a back a wall bouncing all that fun stuff but like i said i'm not really a super big fan of the verses because of the whole team reliancy thing 
If you're a fan of it, though, you probably already know everything about it, and everything that I would be giving you would just be very basic tips. But if you are very new to it or you have a question, feel free to ask, and I will do my best to provide the information that I can. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this uh, advanced boot camp, so to speak. And like I mentioned, questions are welcome. If you guys did enjoy the video, help me out. Go ahead and smash that like button. And of course, subscribe for more content. If you haven't picked up your copy of Gears 5 yet, there will be a link in the description where you can order it from Amazon. And then my channel gets credit for that as well. Uh, you can also order anything that you want through the Amazon links. And my channel will get credit for it. So that is fan-freaking-tastic. Now that you are ready, go dust off your armor, grab your Lancer, make sure you keep your helmet on, and stay frosty.